Now, last day we talked about Bob the Skeeter Bug, who liked to stomp as he listened to music. And uh, not only did he stomp, but he stomped and moved. He slid. And he would stomp and slide, stomp and slide, stomp and slide, stomp and slide, stomp and slide. Stomp and slide. Now, if I go back to that first stomp and slide, he stomped when he was here. By the time the ripple got there, Bob had gotten to that location there. From that picture, that picture alone, we can say that Bob's speed is much slower than the speed of the ripples. Okay? If we were dealing with sound waves, we would say that Bob's speed is much less than 343 meters per second. Okay? And we, we use this construction to talk about the Doppler shift. The, these were the ripples on the pond, or in the case of sound, these were the, the wave fronts, the high pressure regions. And so the distance from crest to crest is a wavelength. And so you see here, the wave fronts are pushed together. If I look at that grand high equation, the wave equation, the speed is either the speed at which, which ripples go out on the pond, or in the case of sound, it would be the speed of sound, which is 343 meters per second at room temperature. So that stays the same. So if these uh, wave fronts are bunched together, the frequency has to increase. And that's going to be the case out here, when the source is coming towards you, or you're moving towards the source. On the other hand, if you're back here, and the source is going away from you, or you're going away from the source, in that case, the wave fronts are spread out, meaning the wavelength is bigger than it should be, and that means the frequency must be smaller to give me the same speed. So here I would have a shift up in frequency, here I would have a shift down in frequency. This is moving towards and moving away. That, that's review, that's old news. Okay? Now, turns out Bob has a brother named Billy Bob. Yeah. Who knew? And you wouldn't expect uh, someone named Billy Bob to be faster than someone named Bob, but Billy Bob's fast. Billy Bob's quick. And from that picture, you can tell how quick. How quick is Billy Bob? He's as fast as the wave, almost. Almost. He's almost as fast as the wave. Now, if we think about the analogy with the pond, and if we think of each ripple as being a half centimeter high, elevated above the pond, <laughs> he sees half a, half a centimeter of water in front of his nose. And then he stomps and slides. What does he see in front of his nose now? If we believe in superposition, namely adding up the pulses, he sees a centimeter of water. Now, a centimeter of water is not much to you, but for Billy Bob, that's... That's appreciable. And now he stomps, and he sees a, a centimeter and a half. And now he stomps, and now he sees two centimeters. And now he stomps, and now he sees two and a half centimeters. He sees a wall of water in front of him, if we believe in superposition. Okay? Now there's some non-linear effects that are going to come into play and keep those little ridges from actually building up a wall of water in front of Billy Bob. You've never seen that happen in real life. But we can, if we use what we know about waves, we can think of that as, as a very uh, high amplitude of water. Or, if we think of this as sound waves, this would be a whole bunch of compressed air all bunched up on top of each other. Now, if you think of a plane like this, the sound that it makes is not just a stomp and slide, it's the roaring of the engine. And it's creating all sorts of these circles. And if you're traveling at just below the speed of sound, and you've been traveling at that speed 
all afternoon, what that means is that all the noise your engines have made and pushed out in front of you all afternoon, all the compressed regions are right there together at your nose. Okay? Now, how many of you saw that uh, movie, The Right Stuff? Okay, where they were, the, the test pilots were trying to get their plane to go through the sound barrier. Now, as a kid, I thought the sound barrier was just some psychological barrier. But they were sitting around these test jock, uh, test pilots were sitting around the bar and someone said, I bet you can't go 343 meters per second. I bet I can. Prove it, you know. It's not like that. It's not a psychological barrier. It's a physical barrier. <coughs> when they get going at the speed of sound, they have this wall of compressed, very highly compressed air right in front of them, and they have to punch through it. That's why in that movie, the plane was, you know, rattling apart. Okay? Now, what if we've got a bug that is faster than sound? or faster than the ripples, if we use the analogy. You can see from this that this bug is about 20% faster than the speed of the ripples on the pond. And so if he just keeps on uh, stomping and sliding and stomping and sliding and stomping and sliding and stomping and sliding, <coughs> now we have a, a set of ripples that look like this. Now, if we use superposition, the ripples are only overlapped and higher right here and here and here and here and here and here. And they're not that high because there's only two circles that overlap. But if instead of a skeeter bug, we have a plane, and if that plane is creating all sorts of sound, white noise of all different frequencies, then instead of being five circles, you'd have an infinite number of circles. And they'd get smaller and smaller as I got here, and they would all overlap along these two lines, and that would form a pressure front, a region of highly compressed air. Now I'm constrained by finances to, to do this on a two-dimensional screen. I couldn't afford the hologram, the holodeck. Okay, but if we did this in three dimensions, this wouldn't be two lines, what would it be? Cone. It would be a cone. It would be a cone. Now I would characterize that cone by drawing a right triangle. We call it a mock cone. And there's the right triangle, and there's the 90 degrees. Okay? Now let me see if I can, I can make the parts of this triangle uh, connect to physical things. If I look at this hypotenuse, oh, that's the mock cone angle. Let me just step back for a moment. Suppose you have two planes, one was going Mach 2 and one was going Mach 5. What does that mean? Mach 2. What's that? Two times the speed of sound. Two times the speed of sound. Okay, so the Mach number The Mach number is equal to the speed of the plane divided by the speed of sound. So if this plane is going twice the speed of sound, it's going 686 meters per second. The speed of sound is 343 meters per second, and that gives me a Mach number of 2. Okay. So Back to my question, if I have two planes, one going Mach 2 and Mach, one going Mach 5, what can you tell me about the Mach cones of those planes? What will they look like? Brave soul, raise your hand. The slower speed will have the greater angle. Okay, so the one that's going slower, the Mach 2, will have a fatter angle. And the one that's going faster, uh, if you think of that Skeeter bug just really, really going fat five times faster, than the speed of the ripples, he's going to be way the heck and gone before that first ripple gets anywhere, and I'm going to have a very narrow cone. So what I'm getting at is this angle is going to tell you how fast the, the plane is going. If you can find that angle, you can find the speed of the plane, and I'll show you how. 
Now another thing you know is that if one plane's going Mach 5 and one's going Mach 2, the one going Mach 5 is a Russian plane. I don't know why, but the Russians have kind of the, the corner on fast planes. They've got the, the MiGs that go the fastest, okay? Now, the hypotenuse of this right triangle is how far the plane got during the time that I was looking at it. There was the first location of the plane, there's the last location of the plane, so that's just how far the plane got, which is the speed of the plane times the time. Now, if I look at the sound that was created right when the plane was here, at its first location that I was looking, that sound went out in all directions and made a great big circle. If I go out radially, in such a way that I come in perpendicular to the uh, mock cone, that distance there is just how far the sound went, right? I mean, I could have drawn a line out here or a line out here. Any line that goes out to this circle is going to be how far the sound got during the time that I was looking. But I use this particular line because that's going to be the opposite side of my right triangle. And I know that the sine function is the ratio between the opposite side and the hypotenuse. Well, the opposite side is just the speed of sound times the time interval. The hypotenuse is the speed of the plane times the time interval. And the time interval is going to cancel. And so what this is going to give me is 1 over the Mach number. Okay? Think about it. If the Mach number is the speed of the plane divided by the speed of sound, and the sine of the angle theta is the speed of the sound, over the speed of the plane, well, that's going to be 1 over the Mach number. Okay? Where did they get that name, Mach? Mach. A student asked that last period. I had no idea. So, being that we've got the intertubes here, he quickly ignored my lecture and went on to the inner tube. I don't know that he ever came back to listen to my lecture. But he found that it was named from a, for an Austrian philosopher and physicist, Ernst Mach. Ernst Mach. So, it's a German thing. Well, Austrian, but they're German. Ooh. The Austrians here, I'm sorry. Hey, <laughs> Good show. Good show. Okay, now, people. There's going to be at least one mock phone problem on the midterm. And I will give you a hint. If you get to the end of that problem and you find that you did not have to use that equation there, you can just give yourself a zero and save us the time. Okay, if you did not need that equation, you did it wrong. You did it wrong. That equation connects the Mach cone geometry with the speed of the plane. <laughs>